But I stay in my vertical. Like real estate's my thing. You know, I'll sell them the building. I'll manage the building. I'll lease it up. But I don't like, I stay in what I know. Yeah. I think it's a good point. I think it's a good piece of wisdom right there, right? Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Keys of Commonwealth podcast. Uh, I am joined today by Andrea Cautry, um, who is, a, I would say, an entrepreneur at heart, I think, in many ways. Um, but we're excited to see, uh, hear, hear her story, um, learn everything that she's doing on both the realty side, property management side, and commercial and residential owning of uh, uh, property. So uh, without further ado, Andrea, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I'm really excited. I feel like this is like rapid fire because we've met yeah. and you met my husband, right? but we don't know what we're going to talk about so much. So kind this is kind of bit. fun. Yeah. And so yeah. I, I, I've always usually had these very planned out in some respects and I kind of like that. And it definitely got me very comfortable in an interview process, yeah. but I think sometimes just going with it and not, you know, we kind of know where we're going, but at the same time it can open up a interesting parts of our conversation we, who knows where we're going to go. Yeah. So that's exciting. Uh, but yeah, we, we always start every podcast off with kind of jumping back in the DeLorean, um, jump back and say, Hey, how did you get to Lexington and into real estate and so forth to begin with? Tell us about who you are. Yeah. So the funny thing is I used to always equate my start in real estate to my husband because mm. he had these, um, horrible properties that were horribly managed that it was just like a show. Right. 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 And I, I, we told you that story, yeah, but yeah. obviously we haven't told the listeners that that story, but I actually realized that my grandmother still to this day owns okay. and lives on a trailer court. So I don't know why I never, she has rented <laughs> and ha- owned a trailer court. So like, it was just part of your normal, like you didn't even I think never about even it. thought about yeah. that. Yeah. And then the other day after we spoke, I was like, you know what? husband, you're not yeah. the reason I have my start in real estate. Okay. Maybe I, it was always there. And I didn't know that. So she is like literally 86 years old running a trailer court still. I swear to you. Like really? Oh, she's yeah. running it. Yeah. She lives on it, and runs it. Wow. Yeah. It's like a whole thing. And in, in that's like all, that's kind of Eastern a, that's Kentucky. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to know her stories, right? Who oh knows my what God. Kind of story she no, has. her. And, and the thing is, it's like, like a real one. So like, there's like some real sh- that goes down. Right. I remember <laughs> being a kid and she was like, get out there and play. And I'd be like, I'm scared. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want yeah. to go play. <laughs> Cause you're originally oh from, gosh. uh, Eastern Kentucky. Yeah. Right. Pike County. Pike County. Yeah. So, uh, definitely a different world, obviously in that sense. So kind of talk to me about, you know, growing up in Pike County, what you did before that. And then now I love the kind of the story of how you've made it over in a sense, like, you know, more on the entrepreneur side, moved to Lexington, and you got your hands on a bunch of different stuff. And yeah, for sure. So, yeah. So I went to the University of Pikeville. Okay. Um, that's where I got my master's in business administration. My emphasis was marketing. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I was looking for something to kind of do yeah. that because I had done news actually, funny enough. Okay. I mentioned that to you earlier. Yeah. And it was too demanding time wise. I had my son young, so I already had my son. Okay. And I wanted something that I could do while being in grad school, make some money, but be flexible. Yeah. And between my husband's really bad real estate portfolio <laughs> and finding out how bad property managers were, yeah. it was just so easy to take that on. So I started doing property management. You're like, here, um, let, me, let me take this. I got this. Surely yeah. I can do better than what's happening. And for sure I did. And the funny thing was those properties, we had 23 in Atlanta at the time. Yeah. And uh, a few kind of dispersed around different areas, like one in Rochester, New York, 23 right. in Atlanta, like one in Eastern Kentucky that he hadn't okay. gotten rent for in like a year. Um, <laughs> it was like, it was bad. Okay. Right. So I'm like, you know, we tried multiple property managers and property groups yeah. in Georgia, which you would think there would be a lot to choose from there. That's a big city. Yeah. And I spent more time just going through the books and finding mistakes and right. fighting for reimbursement and disputing charges than I could have just doing it virtually. So at the time, okay. being in grad school, I literally was doing all this, but like uh, mailing in checks, Excel spreadsheets. Right. 23 properties out of state. We uncovered like so much crap at each of those properties. Yeah. Well, so, tell me about the, uh, one of those stories where you thought something had been fixed oh or God. something like yeah. deciding. Is that right? I oh, remember. that's a big one. That one was yeah. kind of crazy. So my dad actually, he is like jack of all trades. He could do anything. So sure. I'm like, all right, I've taken over these properties for a period of time now. Like let's actually look at them. Cause yeah. my husband had never seen any of them. Okay. okay? None of them. Very hands off. Yes. Um, investor. Yes. Okay. Very, very, but like 
with improper <laughs> management. It was crazy. So my dad goes down to this vacant unit to look at it. Yeah. We started, we were like trying to take inventory of what we had. Um, the market was doing really well. Some of these had been rezoned into amazing school districts. So he goes down he's like, I thought you said that this one had new siding. I'm like, look, this is just what Brennan told me. Okay. I don't know. And I don't think he knows. My dad's like, yeah, they put siding on three sides of it, which were the photos my husband got of the front and one side. The back was like exposed wood. I don't know how oh. it didn't rot. And for example, like uh, in a kitchen. So she would do one kitchen, right? Yeah. In like a quadplex. And then the other three would have like, uh, floor tile for the backsplash. Like, so he was, so he was like taking money to fix these things up and she was probably just go doing one nice. Well, yeah. Three non so well yes. and pocketing probably the difference. So she would do three sides of the building, not the back renovate oh, one, gosh. not the other three total fraud. Oh, it was a gosh. really big nightmare. Um, but the crazy thing is my husband really just has the biggest heart and yeah. he still, he was like, I don't know. Do you think she'd do that? <laughs> She did. Proof is in the pudding. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like it is. Yeah. No, and he's so, great. I met him obviously. Yeah, like that. Yeah. But yeah, it's hard when you're also, cause he's obviously uh, in the medical field and, yeah. and doing other things when you're trying to also do real estate investing from a passive standpoint, you know, it's, it's hard to have that time to really be able to kind of checking in on those things. And yeah. that's where like the aspect of having a great, um, property manager is so key. I mean, cause one that you can trust and you know, things are getting done. And yeah. obviously that wasn't the case in this, but hopefully I think that is the case now for sure. So you've yeah. taken over, I think most of that stuff and kind yeah. of had that as part of the other thing that you do with real estate investing. Yeah. Right? And at this point we have sold everything in Georgia except for two houses. Okay. And then with that, uh, most of those were 1031 exchanges, mm -hmm. actually, um, three of the quad plexes that had a uh, really good school rezone. We actually sold Sold those, okay. took the capital gains hit, and invested yep. in some oh, uh, really? ramen noodle franchises there okay. in Georgia. So we're going to we bring like, those to Kentucky. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know because um, we've thought about it. Yeah. But the thing is, our partners there are such rock stars, yeah. and somebody here would have to be the rock star. Rock but star. I stay in my vertical. Yeah. Like real estate's my thing. You know, I'll sell them the building, I'll manage yeah. the building, I'll lease it up, but I don't like. I stay in what I know. Yeah. And I, think I think it's a good point. I think it's a good yeah. you know, wisdom, piece of wisdom right there, right? Staying in kind of like your, your husband's great at what he does and stuff like oh, that. Yeah. You're great at what you do. You know, like that. I'm good in insurance. I'm good in real estate, but I'm, I'm not going to be good at property managing. Like yeah. my property manager is my real estate partner and he does fantastic yeah. at that type of thing. And so. Well, something that my, um, husband has always said, nobody cares about your baby like you do. And, mm -hmm. and we believe that wholeheartedly in that, your partners have to believe in it and be a part of it. Yeah. You want the people you're involved with to have a piece of it because, right. you know, for me, this, these properties mean everything because it's our investment stream. It's our passive income. It's our active income. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, my image because, you know, I've got clients who trust me with their portfolios yeah. and because I'm also in this property management, I'm also in this yeah. investing, it, it makes it different. Sure. You care a little more. A lot of times what you have at property management groups, what I've found is you've got a guy maybe who cared at one point, but you've got all these young people or older people who don't give a crap. Like yeah. they're there, they're punching in and out and they don't care. And that's, and that's the hard a little thing. bit unique with you is that you're usually a part of all facets of it from the acquisition, not only the property management side of things, but also you're there as far as the relation, building that relationship with them, even on the acquisition side of a lot yeah. of times, right? Yeah. It's like a one-stop shop. Yeah. So I'm so, actually, yeah, talk about the whole business then from yeah. that, that standpoint, as far as what all you do with, with that. And in real estate, I think you hear a lot, what's your niche, find your niche. And it's like, I never I hear that insurance a lot too. Don't yeah, worry. you do. Like what niche? I mean, we're all buying and selling real estate. Like, <laughs> but honestly, something yeah. that organically has just happened. And, and it's funny because it's what I've done yeah. and you just think everyone else is doing it, but they're not. There's actually a ton of real estate agents who might own a house here or there, but many of them don't have multi-million dollar portfolios. Yeah. Many of them do not invest in commercial SF they don't do that themselves. So yeah. what I found, I have this really easy ability to discuss with somebody like, what are your goals? Okay. Mm -hmm. So your wife makes whatever a month and your goal is to replace her salary <laughs> right. so she can retire and stay home and take care of the kids. But you guys still have that money coming in. All right. What's that amount? 
all right, what types of properties? Because I've invested in all of them. Yeah. You know, I don't do flips. I don't do mm, sure. um, like Airbnb or anything like that. Like I said, I pretty much stay in a niche and I, I buy, yeah. I hold, I rent. That's what I do. So commercial property as well as well, like flex type stuff as well as, yeah. uh, and then habitational multifamily type of things. Yeah. Is that primarily yeah. the... Yeah, this, so this it's large, mu- at this point, it's all large multifamily or commercial. Yeah. 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 Um, commercial, office, or medical, we've done kind of all that. So right. because I have done different investing strategies in the buy hold, which is typically somebody who's looking for like a steady residual, yeah. like income or replacement. Or something along That's those what lines. they want. They yeah. want something a, yeah. a little safer, you know, it's sure. risky, but safe. Um, so I, I start on the consultation side. What are we looking to do? Okay. What types of properties, investments within real estate, of course, fits the bill. All right. Then I go and help find those, procure those properties. Then I help them purchase those properties and then I help them do renovation, lease it up and then manage it. So it's kind of a one-stop shop. So like as soon as I leave here, I'm going to meet a client who just flew in last night from Hawaii. Yeah. You were mentioning you've got a client, so you've been a client for a while out of Hawaii and you've got clients all over. It seems like investing in Lexington area and so forth or different parts of Kentucky. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's a cool aspect of like being able to kind of, and I know she's coming in for the first time kind of a thing and be able to show them, you know, one, it's weird. It's a weird concept to me of like not even be having, being able to see with my own eyes what I'm buying for a regular yeah. real estate type of a yeah. purchase. I mean, I guess it's no difference in stocks in some respects. You don't see the companies you're necessarily really, well, but it all hinges it's on who So they're really trusting you, you in that scenario too. If yeah. they're not even, never even seeing it. Because think about what happened to my husband. You know, she was a sweet old lady. Like, there was no reason to think she was a total fraud. Like, and and it's just straight up. I'm not talking trash. It just was. (laughs) And, you know, he trusted her wholeheartedly. Like, he thought that, you know... She was a family member to him at that point, and it was just not that way. And so for me, having had that happen to us, Mm -hmm. I take like that extra care and like, I want them to be happy when they eventually come here and visit. I want them to be like, okay, yeah, Yeah. you know, so I try to advise them as best as I legally can as far as schools and neighborhoods and everything, but um, Ultimately, it's their portfolio and their decision, and I work for them. Yeah. That's, and I you think, have to have that mindset. Yeah. I think a lot of times, like, you know, um, real estate agents, insurance agents, we don't feel like we're in the service industry. Like, we are, you know, we we definitely service yes. our clients. Yes. Like, you, you have to have that mindset. And when people tell me, oh, I'm getting into real estate because I want flexibility, I want to set my own schedule, I'm like, <laughs> what kind of real estate are you going to work in? Because yeah. yeah. I haven't found that yet. Yeah, you're, <laughs> That's, you're always on. I mean, yeah. you don't really get to hang it up, turn it off. You yeah. never really go on vacation. You just go on trips. Yeah. You know, that yeah. type of thing. No, so I get it a lot, but, uh, and then that's really neat how you've kind of been able to utilize the, and bring that to a lot of people, investors outside of this. Um, and, and to that point, I, I know we were talking off here, uh, you even had the opportunity to be on, be on a couple into, uh, HGTV type of scenarios as yeah. well, which you were saying one of them was the boat scenario. What you got to say that again. I, yeah, I, so. I feel like I at least know what these shows are or seen it, but that was one I was not familiar well, with. Well, for sure, you know, HGTV house yeah, hunters. Yeah. yeah. So I did an episode of HGTV right. house hunters. Um, that was a lot of time, a really? lot of time. It was like yeah. a whole day kind of. A thing uh, oh my more. gosh. Multiple days, tons really? of work. Um, it was a lot that, that went into that, yeah. but the most recent TV that I did was uh, below deck, which is yeah. like, it, it's on Bravo. You know, okay. you're familiar with oh, the network. Okay, yeah. 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 Um, and it's like just these people <laughs> on this mega yacht. It's like you charter oh. this mega yacht. Okay. And this show really like the, the premise of it. Yeah. What's the premise? That's what is I'm trying to the out. crazy um, drama between the like stews and the chef and the captain on the boat. Really? So like they have so much drama, like they're sleeping together <laughs> or they're like throwing food at each other. Cause they're like, like half living on this thing. Uh, probably at the same yeah. Time. Cause they all live on it yeah, while they're cr- doing these, these charters. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So you're like guest one of however many that season. So that whole season, you got these young, like, uh, people running the boat and the yeah. captain's trying to like keep them in order. It's like <laughs> wild. And the chef is always like catching some 
something on fire or burning his hand. Right. And he did burn his hand while we were there. I think somebody got fired while we were there. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah. That like the guys dressed up like, uh, uh, Chip and Dale, like firemen. It was oh, really, man. it was a lot of fun. Interesting. Yeah. And it was with a group of girls from mainly Lexington. They okay. all had roots. Gotcha. To the area. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. Yeah. A couple okay. of them were realtors as well. So, yeah. Yeah. And so you've kind of, um, have you branched off? You guys just got a new office and kind of moved, uh, some things around and kind of yeah. tell me what's on your horizon for this year. Yeah. Well. So Obviously the, the market's changing rapidly at this point. Rates are crazy out of control. So you really have to be more, uh, focused on what you're trying to achieve, how to achieve it and be kind of quick. I mean, yeah. there's no time to delay or wait a lot of times these days. Right. So no, I think everything in real estate right now is a lot about like mindset yeah. and you're like gearing up for this marathon because just this month, everything has switched in Lexington. Yeah. Everything like last month and before that, I was like, "Oh, we're not paying over list price unless we." I was kind of like, <laughs> yeah. "Check yourself, buyers!" Like, we're not paying over list price. This I lied to you, yeah. Because now, um, in the last two weeks, between me and my buyer's agent, we've had about eight offers get outbid, wow. and I'm talking really good offers. There's this weird false sense of like, "All right, maybe things are coming back down a little bit." In uh, in, you know, needing to, not needing to offer over asking or different things like yeah. that. Right. Maybe as a few less Throw that out the options window. as far as the, uh, who's putting in offers on the home or the yeah. property, et cetera. But yeah, you're right. In the last month or so or two, it just ramps right back. Yeah. Up April has completely been a game changer. I mean, I feel like I'm back in last summer. I'm running, yeah. just trying to get clients in houses. Yeah. Right. And so on the listing side though, it's weird. All right. Because you've got like some houses that just kind of sit. Yeah. And that's normal an indication that it's overpriced. Yeah. But the problem is it's getting, um, sellers to see that, you know, I think they want to just throw these big stickers out mm -hmm. to see if we can fish somebody back in. <laughs> and quite often you can. Yeah. So it's a weird, more than ever kind of gray scale with pricing. Yeah. You know, no, that I see it. it's tough. And I think there was, you know, for people that jumped into real estate, it was probably I was like, Oh, it's so easy back mm -hmm. three years ago. Right. When everything, when rates were at two percent or whatever yeah. crazy yeah. like that. And now it's like, no, it, it's this is when realtors really uh, show their value, yeah. obviously, because here there's a lot of work that goes into trying to make sure that you put your best for it's not just a matter of here's the offer, it's accepted, whatever type of thing. There's a lot of work now, yeah. It's not even where I think realtors can show their best uh, sell for the best version. I think yeah. it's where you can see who's actually making money yeah. because in a market where you are showing one client, six, seven houses, and you keep getting outbid, you're going to have buyer fatigue. People are falling off. Yeah. Um, you can sell anything. So any agent could sell in that market, right? You just right. stick the yard sign up and I mean, they can screw up your deal, but anybody could sell in that kind of a market. Yeah. So I think sometimes you really have to hone in on your skill set when you know, there's more inventory when you're more shifted in the buyer's market. Mm -hmm. But in this kind of a market, I think it's just when your clients are getting buyer fatigue, you really have to say who has reserves built up, who's actually running their business like a business. Yeah. How can you afford to continue paying your admin when you can't get something under contract because you're getting outbid by cash every day? Yeah, that's a big issue, yeah. obviously. Because as we know, like the Central Kentucky market, for the most part, has always been very insulated uh, to an extent from the outside forces of, you know, the housing crash of 08 and so forth like that. Obviously, yeah. College Town, a lot of industries moving to this area. Obviously, throughout the pandemic, I mean, I had countless people moving here. It wasn't like a Texas or Phoenix scenario, but I mean, people were like moving here, never been. I couldn't believe it. People that had like never stepped foot in the state and they already had a contract and were buying a house and their first time going to be in the state of Kentucky, for example, was to walk into their new place, which yeah. was just like crazy to me. Like, I mean, maybe if they were moving to California, I understand that. Like, I'm like, people are moving to Lexington. Oh, maybe for sure. Central Kentucky. We're like an, un well, we're like a hidden gem. Oh we gosh, really are. Right? We really are. I mean, we have amazing food, amazing people. We've got beautiful homes. We've got space. We've got a great mm -hmm. airport. Like, I love Lexington yeah. and we looked, you know, when I moved from Eastern Kentucky here, we looked at other options mm -hmm. where to move and we chose Lexington, not out of necessity, but out of like, yeah. we love it. Yeah. And when you fly in, it's so beautiful. Oh, the only place I can really, so I love to travel too. Yeah. Um, where, where are we going with this? 
So like Lexington reminds me of Ireland. I was going to say, I've been to Ireland yeah, in Northern in Ireland. In a lot well, of sense. Say, same way. Yeah, yeah. It's like. I would almost say that's the more, mo, that's the one place where it's like more green. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It's, it's a crazy it way. It smells but yeah. really like sheep. <laughs> like there I swear to God like it's yeah. so sheepy there yeah, like I'm yeah, always yeah. like everywhere we'd be driving like it really smells like sheep yep. and we don't smell like sheep but it, yeah. um, that's the only difference no, like really, when you're going back like on it. like Delaney and like some of those yeah. areas in Nicholasville I mean you really get that sense mm -hmm. it's pretty cool it yeah really is. and I, that reminded me because of the, the show he's been etc like that a few years ago maybe they had the top chef Oh, you yeah. remember in Lexington and yeah. or, or Kentucky, I guess specific. And you're just like, there's a lot of cool things. I was, I was shocked to see a major kind of thing like yeah. that kind of put their focus on Lexington and Kentucky and Louisville at the same time. But yeah, it's it great. Cool. So where do you see everything kind of going the rest of the year, 2023 so, at this point? I mean, obviously no one knows for sure, but yeah. you know, if I'm a buyer looking to invest in property around here and give God. you a call or whatnot, I mean, what's, what's your advice in that sense yeah. as far as the season goes? So I'm still getting deals under contract. You know, I've, I'd rather at this point, I love my uh, first time home buyers. Mm -hmm. I love, you know, working with people that that's their personal home, their forever home, but yeah. it's easier with the buyer because we get, a, a, that's an investor because we get crazy. Crazy, right? Yeah. Like I was telling you about the 15 units that I just got under contract. Mm -hmm. And here's a good point. Um, I'm still buying. I've bought in all different markets since yep. like 07, we've been buying mm -hmm. and I'm buying everything that makes sense. And a lot of people are buying everything that makes sense or anything that maybe even sometimes doesn't make sense just because yeah. they can. Yeah. So, I mean, some people, oh, we're in a bubble, the interest rate, the interest rates to me are fine. Like yeah. a six to an eight is historically a decent interest rate. Sure. If we were looking at like 12, 13, I might be like, well, you know, my money's not going to go that far. Maybe yeah. I want to do other things with it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But like a six all day, every day, like the one I closed last month of the, the 15 units, yeah. um, I got like a 5.62. I floated it super risky up until the day of closing. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we, what do you mean by floating it? So I literally just floated the rate till closing. So it was oh, a total oh, oh, Russian rate. roulette. Like, yeah, yeah. what are we going to get? And yeah. so my guy, um, I don't want to give you my guy because okay. he's the best, yeah. you know, yeah, we'll but now I'm kidding. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I call him up and I'm like, <laughs> all right, let's float it. Would yeah. you do it? He's like, sure. Why not? Why so, not? and then what like, have to lose? for example, I was in a 1031 exchange. Uh -huh. So I only had that 45 days yep. to identify. Um, it's 45 days to identify yeah. and 40, another 45 to close. Like 180, I think to close. Oh, it's never a problem okay. to close. It's the identify that scares people gotcha. to so find the property you under contract. Yeah. You have to identify? disclose in the 45 days what you're going to purchase. Okay. Um, Maybe even it's a weird situation where you're not under contract yet. Like maybe you have something you mm -hmm. want to sell yeah. and you're like, Hey, I'm going to sell this to you, but I don't want to notify my tenant until whatever, yeah. something. Right. But right. as long as I disclose that I'm purchasing that, yeah. then that's fine. And we talked about a little bit with when it comes to the 1031, almost you sometimes try to take the inverse for sure. Uh, uh, play. You play, make a play, but inversely, meaning find the property first, and then you can go and sell the property that you would have been that you will eventually ten thirty one into that, right? So there's a technical One term, reverse ten thirty ones. They're a little more tricky. I don't really do that. What I do and have always done, even in other markets, especially in this market, like if you are going to do a ten thirty one exchange, mm -hmm. here's why people don't do it because they're worried they'll lose out on. Well, I'll be straight up with you on the one I just bought on Donnabrook. I told them it was a 1031 exchange, but I hadn't super sold the other one yet. Yeah. You know, like I hadn't closed on it, but it didn't matter. I had the money. I could have just bought it without the exchange, okay. you know? Okay. So it, it wasn't risky for you me because, there. yeah, but uh, we were getting ready to go under contract on it. So I'm like, oh, I need to find something because normally what I've done is I will go under contract with a 1031 clause, mm -hmm. then sell my 1031 property. Yeah. And because normally on commercial, like you're not closing in 30 days. That way you're not scrambling. Yeah. Trying, you've, you know, you've sold and now you just have 45 days to find yeah. something in a scramble you, mode. And then you probably end up with something that you, at the end of the day, probably don't want. Maybe. Yeah. Kind of well, thing. in commercial, 60, 90 days is not a big deal. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you got plenty of time to sell it. So that's kind of how I always have done it. But I've always also known like, okay, even if that falls through, we'll probably still be able to buy it, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah so on that one, yeah. uh, 
it was listed at one one. We ended up escalating it up to one two five. Okay. No inspection. Right. Hadn't seen it till yeah. the day I closed on it. And that's not unique for us. We own properties mm-hmm. we've never seen. Yeah. So it's just a whole other whole different level and different ball game. I mean, once you get to that yeah. point, because I mean, when you're smaller, you you're like me, you've just kind of started. I mean, you have to you have to just nickel and dime and figure out what ways yeah. to get it one way or another. I mean, you got to work a lot harder. But that's where I started. But yeah, yeah. And you learned so much through that. Yeah, it's like, for I mean, sure. If you didn't go through that, then oh. you, you I mean, yeah. you just wouldn't be you wouldn't have the experience and seasoning that you need yeah. in that sense in a lot of ways. But there's other times where in different markets that I've purchased something, had a home inspection and hit them on every dime of like, Oop, you're going to do this, this, that, and the other. That was yeah. my real negotiation, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, it just depends on what market you're in, what, what you yeah. can do. But going back to what you were asking, like for a buyer, I would love to have more investor buyers, right? Because mm-hmm. we're going to waive inspection. We're going to not ask for closing costs normally. Like a lot of the things that, you know, to be a primary buyer you need, yeah. it's going to make it easier to get deals done. Yeah. You know, and I had um, investors last year that bought seven deals or more and yeah. it happened. You know, they made it work. We made it work. We found the deals. We made the numbers work. And like we talked about off air too, it doesn't always have to be like that perfect 1% rule. Yeah. You have to make the deal work now because also like the one that I just bought that's 15 units came from a $255,000 townhouse. Like yeah. that was the money yeah. I put down. And it's crazy when you start thinking about that, how yeah. little can go, a, a little over sh- a, sh- a shorter period of time relatively can turn into such a big yeah. and, ca- and start to kind of ro- get that rock or a wheel rolling down the hill yeah. in a lot of ways. So as far as like inspections, what you're talking, what you're talking about is that a big thing on the commercial side as far as sometimes having like a, you know, like with a residential home, you know, a lot yeah. of times like, hey, we'd like to see this fixed or this kind of t- whatever on the house. Mm-hmm. Is that a common thing on a real estate, commercial side of real estate at all? Yeah. I so, think it is. so the end of last year, yeah. I bought a 22,000 square foot um, commercial building. It was the first one that my husband and I purchased just us. Like yeah. everything else we've done commercial had been with a, a group of, sure. of partners that we really like and yeah. have other business endeavors with. And this one we purchased just us and we did the full inspection. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times your residential guys will also do commercial inspections because it's the same thing on a bigger scale. And, um, what and all did we get? We had them like replace the back fence. We had okay. some things done. And okay. this one had sat on the market for a while. So, it was more, so more like leverage there. Yeah, we got that it sense. at a good price. We got some work done to it. And the cool thing that I think real estate agents miss out on is rolling their commission into the deals. Yeah, you had mentioned that. Yeah, because why would you get paid on that and pay taxes on that? It's your own deal kind yeah. of scenario. Yeah, I'll roll it all in there. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to roll it in there for you. <laughs> <laughs> right, you're not making money. You're giving away money. Yeah, but no, it makes yeah. sense. Like, yeah. why? And you're saying a lot of them don't do that. I don't think they do. Yeah. I really don't think that's as wildly used as it should be. Sure. Um, but I think it's a brilliant way to just you roll it right in. So, for example, the one that we escalated up on, the one we just purchased, or even that commercial one, those are our two most recent ones mm-hmm. um you know my commission went into the down payment yeah so it's less cash you have to bring to close yeah um it's so actually the first time i've done a cost uh segregation study was on that large commercial we purchased at the end of last year yeah. so i think you just as you grow you learn so many different tips and tricks right and i would say for like new investors like you have an awesome agent you know mm-hmm. um and i'm sure he invests and does things as well and so it's like when you work with people who have been doing it yeah they protect you from pitfalls yeah. like so many things you know somebody's like ah, i don't want to invest in real estate because what if i have to do an, an eviction well i had an eviction i was going to have to f- file this week for a client okay a client, not me. And, um, I just employed the same thing I always do. I called them up. I'm like, look, do you really want an eviction? Just like clean it up, get your stuff out. We'll hold the security deposit, leave in two weeks. They had paid a partial payment already. Plus you're capturing the full security deposit and they get out, they clean it, they take their trash out and they'll leave in, you know, seven days or so. Like if you're a pro active, not a reactive. You mm-hmm. get them before, like no one goes 30 days and doesn't pay us. Otherwise you've got your eviction filed already. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Unless we're in communication with them working something out. Right. Right. But that's also back to having a good property manager and, and being involved. Biggest part of that being proactive and, upfront have to. and honest with everybody. Have to. And now you have that story to kind of relate to your clients too. I'm like, yeah. I was affected this way. That's why I'm going to make sure you're not kind of a scenario. Yeah. And so they yeah. trust you. 
Well, cool. Well, Audrey, Andrew, I appreciate you coming on the show. Um, I never know where these conversations are going to lead. Yeah. And I look forward to kind of getting to know you more over the years to come. Um, is there a good place for anyone to reach you if they did want to invest in real estate as far as where they can find you in that yeah, sense? For sure. Be? Cough tree, C O U G H T R Y enterprises, okay. Instagram or cough tree enterprises.com. That's our website, Andrea at cough tree enterprises.com. Yeah. My admin info at cough tree enterprises.com. Okay. Just no cough tree. And that's yeah. like, you will there find you us. Yeah. There you go. Well, thank you so much for <laughs> thank coming. Thank you. And we will see everybody on another episode of the Keys to Commonwealth podcast next week. Thanks.